if it's giving me infernal typing, then we should go for valiant typing. But there's like all violent units are shit though. Are you serious? <laughs> Shenong's already full. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, I need someone who's strong. Okay, this is probably the strongest uh, feeling type I have. Bill Salmon. Father told me I'm a demon, a worm. I woke up today in a world surrounded by an immense wall. Maybe I should know a voice. And father, he was there, right beside me. He placed a small crown on my head and told me, Never take this crown off, no matter what happens. Hmm. Never lose it either. It's one of a kind. I asked father why, and he said, this is what binds you into a single vessel. Just like how I bound 72 losers from other worlds into the frame of one demon. Hmm? 72 other losers? Hmm. So, no Solomon has multiple frames. Multiple uh, individuals inside him. You are going to forget your name for a while and live as a whole new demon. But beware, if you lose this, then you'll lose yourself forever. I didn't understand much of what he told me, but I did understand that I would become undone. I assumed it would be painful, that would be totally agonizing. I was so afraid, I started trembling. In the end, much to my shame, I started wailing. Why would something horrible like that happen? What did I do to deserve something like that? Father, tell me who I am. What is a demon? Father patted me on the head, held me gently, and asked, Can you remember your past? I answered that I could not. You are what is called a worm, the loneliest of all demons. I asked Father if demons, if worms like me, were bad. If being the scarcest of minorities means they are bad, then they could be considered the most vile of creatures. No matter where I go, demons are treated as evil, but I refuse to believe that. So Father gave me a name instead of just calling me Demon. That name he gave me seemed so long and hard to remember back then. That's why he gave me the nickname Lil Salmon, something shorter than my actual name. His actual name? That's a name that belongs to me and only me. I remember feeling so happy back then. Hey, sorry I'm late, but I came to see you off. I just finished cleaning up. Musashi runs after you, hollering after you leave the crafter's portal. Musashi, where have you been? <laughs> well, I was just a little tied up. I was guarding Kurigani, chasing off some enemies hiding in the shadows. You know, this and that. I shan't think I'd be buttering my own scone if I said everything went smooth like, all thanks to me. I guess I can't really regret prioritizing my client's security, but... I knew you'd be fine, seeing as you managed to hold your own against us five earlier. Still, I gotta say, you got this real daring look up your eye since I last saw you. I'd believe it. And it appears as though you rid yourself of your he hesitation. Do give me a shout if you find yourself in scrap, old mate. I might just come along and lend a hand if it calls for it. I'll think about it. <laughs> I need to tell you something. Yeah, ask away. Guess I ought to be nice for a potential client. What goes around comes around, eh? So, what is it you want to know? Oh, these are all good questions. You better answer them all. Huh? That's a weird thing to ask. Mm, yeah, we fight all the time. Mostly over decisions, but... Maybe it's just me, but I don't think I'd like being alone. 
How come? I mean, sure, combining this all would be easier than splitting five ways. The lack of arguing saved me time, that's for sure. But, wouldn't it be boring to be all alone like that? I like being us. Oh, I don't mind arguing with the other four if it means they've got my back. You mean those with the memories of, from their own sacred artifacts previous owners mixed in with their own? I feel th I failed to see that as an issue, so long as it's intentional. Huh. I even believe it perfectly fine to live on with those memories, assuming that's what one means to do. Although, as they would be picking up where the others had left off, it wouldn't exactly be a reflection of the life they had led. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that you gotta fully understand the facts before you go jumping into things. You gotta decide what exactly makes you, you, and what makes others different. Even if somebody looks like a long lost sibling, even if, you know, an impersonator or someone actually acts exactly like you, or maybe wears your skin, even if there is a carbon copy of your good self, even if you are to meet a shadow of you who's stronger and smarter, and even then, if you happen to be an amnesiac, none of them would really be you. They're all different beings with different names. Hmm. No matter where you go, you're always going to be alone. But that's what makes things interesting, ain't it? Musashi winks suggestingly and laughs. Uh, I guess so. Hope that answered your question. Bottom line, you gotta choose your own path. Whatever you choose, your life's gonna end somewhere. The free and go where you want! <laughs> yeah. I better get going. Hey, out of curiosity, who are you, really? We want to know who exactly stood their ground against us. I'm going to find that out. Know thy opponent, know thyself. Oh, and pass this on to Shuichi as well, if he'd be so kind. <laughs> See you around. Tokyo Cathedral in the east, a portal for ministers and those who have attained enlightenment. A flock of angels take a knee at once, reporting to Michael. What do you command of us, O Valiant Michael? What would you have us do about this intruder? Intruder? Hardly. I'll my guess to pass. And here I was expecting a brawl or two. I'm surprised they made it to you so easily. I thought it would be much harder getting into the base of an opponent like you. So long as you hold that priceless blade, I will treat you with the utmost respect and deference to my role. Michael glances at the sword that Arslan carries at his hip. That jeweled blade once belonged to the wise king, the hexagram, the speaker of knowledge and literature. Hmm. Mononobe. I acknowledged his right to sovereignty. It is only right for me to treat you so, inheritor of fragments of his memories. That is why the angels of Aoyama Guild agreed to recognize you as their king and followed your orders. How sad, if that was the only reason for the loyalty entrusted to me. However, I must hold some similar truths. On my way here, I have noticed many familiar faces of angels who once resided in Aoyama. Yet you have made one incorrect assumption, Michael. I am no longer a king in Aoyama, but merely a guardian. <laughs> yes, Arslan, I know that truth. Much better than you do, in fact. I know who the legitimate good master of Ayama missionaries is, that human who carries the memory of an angel. Jacob. He was involved in a battle at our portal some time ago. He also has been making trouble for the invaders. Most recently, I've heard he has been busy kicking the beehive in the west. Oh ho! <laughs> oh, Jacob, you're so reckless. I was hoping that the Ayama guild would disband with that resistance, and fall under my command with ease. 
We are in urgent need of bolstered forces to stand against the invaders of the South and the warmongers of the West. Arsalan, I believe it would be quickest and easiest if you pass this message to the remaining forces in Ayayama. Haven't I already told you this already? I may have once been a king, but now I have laid the groundwork for my young cubs. I simply watch over them as they follow the paths before them. The young cubs are now grown and ready to stand on their own. That goes for Maria, for Jacob, and for a few other cubs who live in this Tokyo. Hmm. Michael's lips twitch faintly at the mention of those names. What good would it do for an old cat like me to push the ideas of a bygone heir on them? The Ayayama Guild does not need me to lead it any longer. They all decide the direction of their own path. It is unfortunate that we must have conflicting views. You leave me little choice but to resort to the strength of my arms. I will have to take the remaining force of Ayama missionaries by force. You alone. Huh. Michael, valiant angel of Eden, your methods are beyond merciless. You wish to lead the whole flock while keeping them blinded. Michael, as a representative of Eden, do you think that is what your world wishes for? You've got it wrong, Arsalan. As a representative of Eden, my wishes determine what Eden desires. I know the faults of my brothers. That is exactly why I won't follow his example. Hence, I will not change the, my doctrine of granting ignorant bliss to all. If you wish to stop me, that blade you carry will not be enough. In fact, the only thing that could make me stand down would be the ring. Hmm. The ring puts any angel, demon, or even Midas of worms under its control. It could even bind the many demons that have fallen from other worlds into one seventy-two pillar vessel. I see, so it's the ring that's keeping Mononobe together. And it seems that Mononobe is a creature just like Solomon. Even that, though, is just one of the many miracles the ring is capable of. That ring is vessel to a rule that extre is extremely compatible with this one, this Tokyo. Are you talking about the the major rule? What it's called in? The main rule? You're talking about the ring of Solomon, the wise, the teller of knowledge and literature. Yep. You personally gave that ring to King Solomon in days long past, didn't you, Michael? King Solomon? Is that Mononobe? Is he Solomon? If it falls into your hands, no. If it falls into the hands of any world representative, if that ring secret artifact is ever obtained by someone who is able to wield it at all, it'll become a horrific weapon in the context of this war. Of course, since you have inherited part of Solomon's memories, you know better. That ring will never fall into the hands of those who wish for an eternal loop. Pre precisely. It is stored in a place where no world representatives can reach it, as a safety measure. Even if we know of its existence, we cannot get our hands on it. Either way, the wise king will let go of his ring, which can only mean... Precisely, Arsalan. The owner of the ring must never relinquish it. That is the price of its rule. If the bear were to break that rule, they would meet a truly terrible fate. The one known as King Solomon is gone now, you see. He was banished from the world. Welcome to the old Shinjuku Academy building. I see you have returned, Ayrton. Yep, I'm back. I warned you not to come here. But... Come with me. I'll show you the way. Since that's what librarians do and all. You're not going to kick me out? I'm allowed in. You're going to let yourself in either way. There's something here that you want, isn't there? I can tell. I know others who have a similar aura. Furufumi studies you closely, squinting momentarily as if remembering something. Furufumi? Uh, you're giving me ideas. Uh, what? What are you saying? Stop staring at me like that. You're embarrassing me. 
That's nothing. Let's be on our way. It says keep out. I've been tasked by a faculty member who was managing the library in the old skill building. He gave you clearance, so you don't need to worry. Who could it be? Kudufumi takes out a ring of keys, picks one, and unlocks the front door. The rusted door of the old building creaks open. Reading the books given to me by my father, I've gradually come to learn the purpose of this world. There are all sorts of things in this world, and so much that happens, and all of it repeats over and over. The time I spent with father was so much fun, we read so much, excitedly turning each page. He taught me many things, and I grew for it. When I learned about death, that someday I would disappear, I was so afraid that I cried and cried. I thought about death, about the inevitable day, for a long time. I began to wonder, what will I do before the end? How will I live, and what will I accomplish? I begged father to teach me the answer, and he said, You have to figure that out for yourself. No one else can give you the answer. Oh my god. Uh, someone told me this before. Was he really just quoting this? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was shocked. The thing is, nothing in this world is quite like me. I couldn't find a single thing I could refer to, like when I read books. Seeing me struggle, father told me about a certain someone. That's when I saw them. There, beyond the wall, in an beyond the wall, in another world. They had just been born into the world. They were just like me. They were alone in the world. No one else liked them. Seeing how fixated I was, Father said to me, They are just like you. That's you, but from a different world. See, they can't go on unless they sever their true selves from the world. Hmm. That's you, but from a different world. They can't go on without forgetting the fact that they were once a worm. Hmm. The day will come when they regain strength to confront their past. I hope they can stay safe until that day comes. That's what father told me, but like always, I couldn't understand half of what he was saying. I did understand one thing, though. That I was looking at a worm, just like myself. I couldn't take my eyes off this other who was like me, but lived beyond the wall. Father patted my head gently and told me, You need to go and help them. Aid them. Serve them. You must be there for them, at least until the day you find what you want to do for yourself. His words frustrated me, to be honest. I wanted to complain. I wanted to protest. Why should I serve them when I'm the elder? But it's okay, because I am. I am older. I'll swallow my pride and act like an adult. The truth, though, is that I was glad. I am glad. Although we were separated by well, I had so much fun spending my days with someone just like me. Even today, I'm waiting for that voice to call on me. Every time I hear his voice, I pass through the hex drum and fly to my master. I mean, sometimes you summon yourself out. The dungeon music. Furufumi's old man lights your paths. Arthur. You said there is something you want to know, but do you know where to look? Furufumi points to where an abundant number of books are on display. Do you know the title of the book? Even if you do, it may take a while. Why are you taking out a sword here? Huh? What? Is that sword humming? 
I knew it. It's just like Shira said. So, you went inside the library in the old school building as well? I've actually been there before, prior to extracting the memory of Yogg's thoughts. I felt my book resonate, like it was drawn to something. I have a feeling that I'll be visiting the library again one day. This way. That way? Alright. Stay behind me. You and Furufumi walk to the library, led by your resonating sword. Eventually. This one. That book is... Furufumi raises his voice in shock. It is the same book Mr. Mononobi was reading that day. Ars Amaled, Almadel, Salmanis. What is this light? What? What's happening? Something is coming. It's coming from the book. Ah, uh, dungeon time. I can feel it. I don't know. <laughs> But I'm getting hyped, I want to do dungeons all of a sudden. Oh god, fuck you, Infernal Wyverns. Are these dragons? Okay, now I'm starting to understand the point of your dungeon. The silhouettes of fearsome draconic creatures appear before you, poised to strike. But what they do is return to you. Literally just like dungeons again. Oh god, it was a poor decision to bring. <laughs> Whatever, it's silly now. Let's just bring everyone closer together. As long as you're feared, I can attack you safely. God, I love dungeons. Let's 
There, Furu for me take a look. That star. Back then, every night, Mr. Mononobi took me out to show me the stars and told me the stories of how they all came to be. Every night? Jeez, what an OG teacher. Even though they looked the same, each and every one of them had different reasons to shine. There was a fiery star that shone alone, its extreme heat burning everything that came near. That star looked enormous, yet it was composed ent almost entirely of gas. All that could reach me here was its light, projected from so many light years away. In doing so, it would tell me stories of how it lived, somewhere far off in the galaxy, far, far away. Alright, that was a... Uh... Ready, cheeky. The more I learned about the stars, the more intrigued I was. By the time I realized it, I was looking forward to spending time talking about the stars with Mononobe. One night, while we were reading side by side, I started to tell him about myself. I told him of a struggle that I couldn't share with anyone else. I regret that I held for a long time. Mr. Mononobe just sat in silence, listening to my story. He didn't make any judgments. He simply made an effort to learn about me. I remember how comforting it was. One night, as we lie beneath the starry sky, I tried to tell him about myself. It was something so devastating and sorrowful that I swore I would never tell anyone again. But I couldn't come up with any words. My emotions ran wild and my body shook uncontrollably. It's alright, Furukumi. There's no need to rush. Just take it slow. Oh god. The act of challenging oneself to try something new, even just a little, is called courage. I always believed I was surrounded by enemies. I thought my world was comprised of it was comprised of hatred, conflict, and mourning. But then, if someone else, just one other person, wanted to know more about me, I looked up, taking the light of the stars shining across the unfathomably vast distances. They are nothing more than light. I'd always believed they didn't concern me. So why did this light feel different? Staring up at the stars, which I had begun to take for granted, somehow made me tear up. A myriad of shadowy dragons surge straight towards you, and thus towards Furufumi, who is standing directly in front of you. Furufumi! Yeah. 
Those shadows came from the book? Ah, uh, this must be a record of the past. It must be. Please wait a moment, Arathon. What? Ah! Cool, I love his art. Look at this shit. The book is telling me about what has happened in the past, and also... What will happen in the future. Centuries of Nostradamus! I knew it. Listen to me carefully. These are memories of your past. They are memories that got stranded at the end of the world, forgotten by a you who once existed. In other words, these are you, or pieces of what once belonged to you at least. These are the memories of how your life ended in all of the previous loops. Whoa! I mean, I was pulled for this, but still... Okay, fuck you, Rhett. Rhett. Fuck you, Discord. But still, it's, it's still hard to actually finally hear it. You know about the loops? A, a prophetic sacred artifact? Of course. That is what my sacred artifact is for. You're aware of them as well, aren't you? Actually. The seemingly peaceful world of Tokyo falls through again and again. Every time it happens, we all forget everything and are trying to repeat the same ending. This library stores records of every extinction event that the world has ever faced before. And this prophetic record allows us to access them. That is why I know that none of our actions have any meaning. We have tried everything, but changed nothing in him. The world ends no matter what we do. That is why I told you not to come here. It would simply be cruel for you to find out that you will die regardless of what you do. And how you will die at that. If you didn't know, then you could at least live through this eternal loop with a sense of hope. No one could ever go on with such a heavy burden. You should get it out of here, Arthur. But you say it's true. Then why did he bring me here? Because it was my teacher's last wish. No. No, that's not it. Because I'm simply a librarian. I'm only the manager here. If anyone wishes to come in, then it's my responsibility to act as their guide. Nothing more. However, I cannot look away knowing that danger is apparent. There are some things that you don't need to know, that you're better off not knowing. Those memories amount to a vicious enemy that will break you. So I'll say this once again. You should... Huh? Arathon? I'm so glad you cared about me. You lower your sacred artifact and start to walk towards the shadow dragons. What are you? I'm here to learn. You stand before the shadowy creatures and reach out your hand. They reach for you and begin to envelop you. That's just like before, but one thing is different. Hmm. The meeting with Musashi was different? The shadow that once overlapped with your sacred artifact now envelops your whole body instead. Arison! Uh, uh, this is... Oh no. His uh, safety features is being unlocked. At least that's what I think it is. I remember this force. This recklessness. An exception! The rules overloading. You recall experiencing this pain once before. This pain that is now tearing your body apart. Someone screams. The scream comes from inside your own head, your own chest, from the bottom of your soul. Ah, the prophecies! They were called the prophecies, which is Furufumi's sacred artifact and contains the records of this library. Parts to the very page upon which the scream now being released is inscribed. These are the many memories of how you and how your friends have died. You are shown vivid images of the pain and sorrow you felt in that moment, time and time again. Overlapping cause and effect call the memories back to you. The backlash of the path you will follow to your fate pierces through your whole being. 
Old wounds will reopen as though your body has suddenly remembered their existence. This is what only Yuaka and the others saw. This is why I warned you! No single person can carry the weight of this repeating history. Harrison? You could not have handled this when you first came in this world. But you have had many encounters along the way, and learned many things. That is why you are confident enough to say that this is not a curse. You won't be burdened with your past. This pain you feel is not real. It's simply a remnant of the past. It cannot harm you now. You wanted to believe that, so you made a proactive effort to learn of your past. And now that you know, you can believe. History is none other than the fates of others, apart from yourself. Perhaps even those you have crossed paths with. That is all it can teach you. It teaches you how they lived and died, informing you of when to choose a different path. That may not have been enough, but the lack is filled in by the remains of the memories and encouragement that Azathoth and the others have left behind, filling in the void. You have learned of those who fulfilled their wishes and left Tokyo, and that teaches you that you can change the outcome. That is why you have conviction. No one can govern you but you, yourself, and you alone. No matter how many versions of yourself you hold inside, there is no one quite like you but you yourself. <sighs> Sorry, this is just hitting a bit real to me. A bit too close to home. If you can believe from the bottom of your heart that you can choose your own path. If you can believe from the bottom of your heart that you are your own ally. Whenever Master is fighting, a wall always comes between us. That's a wall inscribed with two crossing triangles, just like the pattern in Armory. That wall has always protected me from battle. Sometimes, though, I felt as though I was being touched by something from the other side. Snow? Oh, snow? Dead! Oh, these are the ones who were able to see him, and Musashi! But that touch was so frightening and painful that I simply hid on my side, trembling. I've been so... useless. I couldn't do anything to help Master in this hard battles. I'm always worthless in the end. All I could do was give it pep talks before battle erupted and sneak out of hiding whenever it ended. I kept lying to myself and saying I was the best butler for my Master could ever have. But then, Master asked me... Who I am. So, just who am I? I grew afraid when Master asked me such a thing, because I have no idea who I really am. Father said I was a lonely worm, but I don't even know what that means. I decided I was Master's butler. That's what I believed. But if I'm not useful, and if I'm not fully trusted, then what am I? Maybe there was never anything I could do. Fragments of memories flown to the vessel that is Arathen. Oh gosh! <laughs> A vision of the young Yosh Yoshitsune, the exile of the land of Wa, engulfed in flames. A vision of the young Yurino, exile of Olympus, who disappeared into the Azure Sea. A vision of the young Suzano, exile of, the, of Taka Magahara, fallen upon a great highland. A vision of the young Saitan, exile of Eden, vanished into the distant sky. A vision of ex the exile of the world of the old ones, fallen into decay into the depths of the nether. Visions of many others, who are burdened with many beliefs and weeded out of their homeworlds, appearing in turn. All of the 23 lonely worms who were exiled from the other worlds. You've all been. 
And there, where all those shadowy figures overlap, is a wall behind which stands yet another one. I've come to find you. Salmon. You mutter through the room as you drag your shattered body across the ground. The shadows shroud your vision, swallowing everything into darkness. You hear someone crying. Bill <laughs> Salmon. It is there, beyond the wall, within the storm of the tyranny, which rips you open. Is this... space? Or... <laughs> it is all alone, surrounded by a million floating lights. It waits there, amidst a hell in which a storm of belief raiders and the lights burn. Ah! Furufumi stares at the shaking figure like he is trying to remember. You came to me that day, when I was all by myself. But I forgot. I can't believe I forgot. I didn't even try to remember. I meant to remember. I'm sorry, sorry it took so long. This time, I've come to you. I've made you wait for so long. The figure reacts to words, shrinking away in surprise. Master! Little Salmon, will you come with me? I can't, Master. I don't have anything that can help you. Trust me. I was wrong. What? Belief isn't about knowing. It's believing that allows you to learn. God. <laughs> That's what I was taught. I remember that. A lot of people have taught me this. Let's start to learn about who we are. I want to believe in you. It extends the trembling hand towards you. Your hands come together, grasping onto one another. It was in your hand all along. The ring overlaps the hand that holds your sword. Your hands join, not becoming one, but those of two separate beings. And then, the light starts to overflow. Mr. Mononobe! Seeing what is occurring, Furufumi recalls the day when he was surrounded by millions of stars. It's all right, food for me. There's no need to rush. Just take it slowly. The act of challenging oneself to try something new, even just a little, is called courage. And you decided that based on what you want to believe. What I want to believe. Oh fuck! <laughs> Belief. Mm. You believe not because you know them, but you learn about them because you want to believe. To believe. Oh boy. It might sound some really like some really hackney crap that any anime would spit out, but I've just had my own issues with belief recently. And 
Especially doubt. I've, I've really learned how to believe better. And to take the courage to actually choose what I want to do as a result. In the blink of an eye, the wall that had been separating the two of you disappears. It melts away like it was never even there. Master! Oh! <laughs> Little Salman. Master, I've been... All this time I've been... Let's start learning. We're in this together. I'm happy we're together again. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. A large group of shadowy beings mill about behind Salomon. You were here all this time. You were all inside little Salomon. You've been waiting for so long. To Furufumi looking on, it appears as if those many figures are smiling as they watch over the two of you. I will learn everything about you all. I'm going to learn one step at a time. <laughs> you and those Solomon embrace each other, and light begins to creep from your two bodies in a slow melting glow. After the light recedes, a ring engraved with a hexagram shrines in your hand. The prophecies! A new entry is inscribed onto the finally, final, previously blank page of the Book of Prophecy. Does this mean what I think it means? Has this occurrence never happened before in any other of the loops? Mr. Mononobe, is that true? Furufumi murmurs the name of the teacher who is no longer with him. A stream of tears running down his cheeks. Mr. Mononobe, hey, are you there? It doesn't look like he's here, either. Hmm. I wanted to talk to him about some administrative issues. But where could he have gotten to? Chapter 9, The Crafters, Karmic Engine, and... Ooh! Yes! Bitch! Fuck yeah! Mm -mm -mm. God, that took forever. Literally, like, more than eight hours. Hold on, let me switch to the guild so I don't have to listen to this atrocious music. Alright. So, thoughts on this chapter. It was very long, but completely expected to be a long chapter. Uh, I got the voice leaked. That was definitely the highlight. Uh, it was... Not as good as Chapter 8, for sure. <laughs> uh, but it's really hard to top Chapter 8 with, you know, Jiro dying and everything. Oh, Shino, I miss you. But damn, that was a, quite the introduction for uh, just reintroducing Azathoth and everything. And Azathoth really gave us a, or at least breaking Azathoth's body, really gave us a, a bombshell with all that information. And uh, I guess we didn't really get to know Azathoth that well in Chapter 7 and 8, besides, you know, him murdering Shino's ass and being like, uh huh, what happened? But, and this time, uh, you know. Uh, Break being able to be his sort of voice box for once when uh, he was previously just set in madness and unable to speak anything uh, that was actually understandable. It was just insane how insightful, like, as his thoughts was if you could actually get him not to be fucking, you know, mind broken. All that information about, like, Master Rule, um, the Rule at All or something, and about the, what's called, the, the hidden thingamajigs underneath the, the, uh, the pillars how pillars aren't just sacred artifacts, it could be literally anything. It could be the sky, it could be the... well, maybe not the sky, but like the the portals themselves uh, that are spread throughout the the different wards. Uh, those things are apparently pillars too, and uh, things that the world representatives can't access. I just think it's uh, really fascinating that information warfare of just like, you think the world representatives know everything, but then someone who's out of the game just happens to know a whole bunch of shit 
uh, that <laughs> may be used to turn the tides of battle. Like, for once, it's like a whole bunch of new shit that hasn't happened in previous loops has happened, and uh, Fulfumi's page started being written anew, and uh, for the once, uh, uh, Searcher, Azathoth, and uh, Babylon won't be coming back if a new loop does happen because they've already fulfilled their roles. And it just seems like a larger picture is finally setting in of, you know, <laughs> not just the shock factor, but like of a greater, like, uh, faction war within Tor uh, Tokyo between the East, uh, Utopians, the West, uh, whatchamacallit's warmongers, and the South invaders. Now, some of those things were really rushed with, like, Chini and Piran from the South, uh, and, like, it wasn't really made clear why the fuck, uh, what's called, uh, Tuskati Poka, as well as, uh, Hombre Tigre and the wrestlers were there. They were there to do, like, what exactly? To harass them? To... Spend remains. Where was that location? Wasn't wasn't there like operation to sp spread memories supposed to happen somewhere in like the west? Why was that like in the south where Oto Ward was? It was a bit confusing why they even went that far. But you know, according to Azistas, uh, they just go for the same target over and over again. Zerg it down. Uh, for who knows what reason? I'm not really sure why they want to. I guess that was their goal after all, to just uh, destroy uh, the Crafter Guild. Uh, I guess. Uh, Arison, or me. I really clutched that by coming there. <laughs> and, yeah. It was a good chapter. And, uh, I kind of wanted to see more of leaks, but it's cool. For once in his, uh, uh, you know, in a while, he wasn't just like the fucking underdog who was kicked around. He was actually, when he spoke, everyone listened. And everyone agreed, and he really showed off his uh, skills as the true guild master up there. Now, hmm, wh where I think the story is going to go in chapter ten. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Some of you can read the translation, but if, <laughs> chapter ten is going to be about the warmongers. Uh, was Yasuori and Tuskatlipoka and uh, Jacob and uh, that one other guy. <laughs> the one other guy. What's the other guy? Oh, yeah. Shenong. Uh, if it's seriously just a single chapter, even though they, they are actually... This is like the first chapter with, like... I mean, it's a new concept you learn about, it, but it's the first chapter with the main three. And it's just the one chapter, too. Uh, you know, between the warmongers, the utopians, and the invaders. I wonder how they can sort of cleanly resolve this. Apparently, the warmongers are in the lead, but finishing it in one chapter sort of implies that... You know, once they're done, they're done. They, they'll take a back seat, sort of just like, you know, how the Rapongi tycoons, the missionaries, and the Ayama uh, missionaries, and uh, the Berserkers all took a back seat uh, after their chapter was done. So, uh, my guesses are, uh, if something new is going to happen, their goal is to keep the, the war going, and it seemed like that was against what Tiscot Lipoka wanted. I'm gonna guess there's gonna be more interaction. There's a uh, Zalotl and, and just just Cali Poka, and just maybe the, I don't think that they'll be so easily swayed after all these loops to change their mind or anything. Like this chapter was just introduced about enemies. Uh, maybe it'll be leads to the collapse of the Warmongers, or uh, at least like yeah, what's it called? Some sort of a disestablishment. Uh, for their leadership or, or conversion of their allies. It's a bit strange how it's going to turn out. Uh, yeah, my thoughts are all over the place, but that's because uh, it was sort of all over the place in terms of what was happening. Uh, but I liked it. I would rate it, let's say, maybe just about as good as Chapter 6. Uh, which is pretty good, because that's Leek's chapter. But, you know, chapter 7 and chapter 8 really take the cake. But for chapter 9, that was more like... Mostly about Hefei's sister's mother issues. And me awkwardly trying to yell out, Mama. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyways, I think I have run out of thoughts that uh, really come out to me right away. Um, 
I don't think that the dungeons will actually be translated. Uh, I'll have to check that later, but that's fine. Anyway... Uh, if you have any comments about my voice acting, uh, I'm sure I have plenty of comments about my voice when I check this over later. Uh, please let me know. It's a, a first time thing, so if it's a bit of a mess, yeah. <laughs> you, you take what you get, and if, you, I, if I can be less obnoxious, or if I should go out even more, uh, just let me know. I want to take this more seriously in terms of uh, being able to vocate uh, each character as accurately as possible, but also not to sort of be a poor imitation of them. So there's a balance between you know, me giving up and using a developed voice versus uh, me tr trying to imitate the voice but uh, ending up seeing me mocking them. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I took a lot of energy doing this, it was over 8 hours, so I think I will, for a while, I'll just be doing chapter translations from now on. Uh, so whenever chapter 10 translate, that's the next time I'll do a major uh, sort of playthrough of it, first time. I'm not gonna do events, at least not until it gets concurrently translated, uh, when it's brand new. So no, I'm not gonna be doing any re releases for the Valentine reprints. Uh, this literally took all day. I'm hungry again, and I gotta go meet with a friend. Alright, uh, that's enough for me. Love you guys. Love one of you, especially. And I'll see you guys later.